Well, if you thought you couldn't get any crazier, well... Honey, you've got a big storm coming. Yes, everyone's favorite serial stalker has taken on London with a trail of bodies that would make even Jack the Ripper jealous. In this video, we take a deep dive into Season 4, Part 2, and how some of the season's biggest reveals set up as Season 5. So sit back with a beer and get ready to dissect a man who has absolutely nothing wrong with him. It's me. The end of part one left us with the reveal that the Eat the Rich killer was none other than Reese Montrose, the prospective mayor of London. But as we get further into part two, we're hit with a bombshell of a reveal. The Reese Montrose that befriended Joe is merely a figment of his imagination, a way for Joe to separate his psycho killer tendencies from his everyday life. In fact, the book he hides his cage key in is Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde, a story about a man with split personalities, a well-mannered doctor, and a murderous criminal. But how did Joe manifest this split personality? In episode 8, Reese says this has been brewing for some time, starting as early as the end of season 3, where he killed his wife and abandoned his son. It was around this time that Joe learned about Reese and became obsessed, just like Dawn became obsessed with Phoebe. Both she and Joe suffer from erotomania, a rare mental health condition that appears when someone is fixated on the idea that another person is intensely in love with them. And for the last time, Kate Upton, please stop messaging. Me. In fact, in the final episode, Reese professes his love, not a sexual love, but one more akin to brothers. Which would make sense since Joe never got to see his half brother again after he found out he was abandoned by his mother. But why Reese? Isn't it obvious? I want a friend. Someone who shares my interests, relates. Someone I can finally tell all my secrets to. Not only does Reese provide someone with whom he can tell his deepest, darkest secrets, but Reese represents the change for the better a man can go through. He's made some mistakes. Yeah, he's done some bad things, but he changed. I'm just saying it kind of inspires me. In fact, Reese's story mimics Joe's journey this season. Reese came from a troubled past and through a random stroke of luck found out he's the son of a duke and used this opportunity to change himself and the world, hence running for mayor. Joe too has come from a troubled past and at the end of the season he's stumbled into becoming one of the richest men in the planet where he can now change the world. We're largely focused on changing the world. Unfortunately, the real Reese got caught up in this whole plan. When Joe interrogates him in episode 7, Reese has no idea who he is, just like Phoebe had no idea who Dawn was. Almost every interaction between Joe and Reese was entirely in Joe's head, even when Reese was around with others. Now, there's a notable exception when Joel interacts with him at Simon Sue's funeral. And just a heads up for the rest of the video, when I refer to Reese, it will now be in reference to Joe's alter ego. Unbeknownst to us, or Joe for that matter, Reese has been busy royally messing up Joe's life, including kidnapping Marion and locking her in one of his trademark cages down in an abandoned subway. We were led to believe that Joe let Marion go way back in episode 1 when he tracked her down to an art show in London, and as far as Joe is concerned, that's what happened. But Reese drugged her coffee and was able to get her to this safe house where she'd witness just how obsessed Joe was with Reese. Joe repeatedly listens to his audiobook, watches videos about him, and even collected a used gym towel. Nadia will later find a map where Joe's marked all of Reese's favorite locations. So when Joe finally realizes Reese is a figment of his imagination, it leads him on this whirlwind of discovery where he eventually finds Marion locked up. Now, he vows to let her go, but he has to do it in such a way that doesn't jeopardize his own freedom. This leads us to the season's final episode, The Death of Jonathan Moore, an apt title since Joe will end the season saying goodbye to Professor Jonathan Moore his English alias and reclaiming his real name. It begins with Joe burning a letter left to him by Marion stating, please leave me where I'll be found. If you remember from season three, Marion is a recovering drug addict and after finding out she would lose custody of her daughter, a fate she says is worse than death, she overdoses. Hence why Joe leaves her someplace she'd be found, a park bench. But as I'll get to in a bit, this was all an elaborate plan setting up Marion's escape. Joe quotes a famous short story by American novel novelist Tobias Wolf called Bullet to the Brain that follows a hero who knows he's going to die. The protagonist in that story also happens to be a professor who teaches writing, just like Joe. Edward's interpretation of the ending is eerily similar to what happens to Joe. Say more. To die thinking of what you most love is it's a gift. 
When Joe throws himself off a bridge, he later tells Kate that all he could think about was her. He literally died thinking about what he loved the most. The nurse even makes a joke when he wakes up that it's his birthday because he died for a bit in that water. This all harkens back to the show's theme of second chances. You know, my favorite thing about love is that it gives you second chances. But with Marion seemingly out of the way, there's still something else preventing Joe from his so-called second chance. That would be Kate's multi-billionaire father, Tom Lockwood, the very man who tasked Joel with killing the real Reese. It's very hard to hear, but the news report states that DNA samples were found on Reese's body. Samples that could potentially link Joe to his death. Reese claims that all of this is some sort of setup by Tom, so as long as Tom's still alive, both he and Kate can never be free. So using Kate's phone, which unlocks by using the birthday of American abstract painter Mark Rothko, Joe poses as Kate wanting a meetup. It's also kind of ironic that this meeting takes place at an airplane hangar, a symbol of flying away. Joe chloroforms Tom and ties him up, but like everything in his life, Tom thinks he can solve the problem with money. But for Joe, this has nothing to do with money. It's about protecting the woman he loves. And this is what makes Joe and Tom similar. You and I are the same, Joe. You do that it has to be done. Throughout her whole life, Tom has protected his daughter from the harsh reality of the world, and whether he admits it or not, Joe is doing the same. In fact, he basically becomes Tom at the end of the episode, a corrupt billionaire. He is the very breed of influence peddling corruption I'm trying to expunge. So Joe is able to frame Tom's bodyguard, Hugo, for the death of Tom, later taking Hugo's body and burying it, stating that this will be the last corpse he'll ever have to bury. <laughs> This leads us to Joe's suicide. Earlier on in the episode, we saw him writing his goodbye note where you can make out phrases like simply doesn't exist, the only way, better place, and the people I love. In his mind, his death is a necessary means to saving Kate's life, for he states that a future with Kate would only end up with him killing her, just like he killed his past exes. He first throws Reese over the bridge and then himself, and it's kind of ironic this happens on a bridge, a metaphor for traveling from one end to another, an old love life to a new. It's only after he's jumped does he realize that he's made a mistake. He doesn't want to die, and this, according to Nadia, revolves around his fundamental flaw, that he can never let things go. He fundamentally, he doesn't let things go. He can't because he, he's an obsessive. He can't let go of Kate, that thing he loves. But this also poses some questions for season five. If Joe finds out Marion is still alive, will that obsession compel him to seek her out? Can he truly let go of those he loves? This leaves us with the second huge twist of the season, that Marion has escaped Joe's clutches and is back in France with her daughter. Over the course of part two, Nadia became increasingly suspicious of her professor, Jonathan Moore, to the point that her investigating leads her to find Marion locked away. Now Nadia's downfall here is probably that she didn't go immediately to the police, but Marion convinces her that doing so would only make Joe flee, and the last thing either of them wants is having to look over the shoulders for the rest of their lives. So the two of them devise a masterful plan to convince Joe that Marion has died. Step one includes making Joe believe that Marion has no reason to live. Nadia ends up changing the phone number of Juliet's caregiver, Beatrice, in Marion's phone, so when Joe texts her, he's actually actually texting Nadia. She makes Joe think that Juliet's grandmother has been given custody of Juliet. With Marion finding this out, it's enough to make her commit suicide. Step two, they have to replace the pain pills meant for Marion's arm with beta blockers, a drug that slows the heart rate so that Joe believes she's actually dead. And finally, step three, Nadia follows Joe as he disposes Marion's body in the park and gives her a jolt of ketamine to wake her up. Now, Joe thinks Marion is dead from this overdose when in reality, she ventures back to Paris to be with her daughter. Meanwhile, Kate visits Joe, who was pulled out of the water and brought back to life. If he's going to get a second chance, he's not going to start off with a lie and vows to tell her the truth. But much to his surprise, she's already covered up the real Reese's murder for him. That DNA found on his body turned out to be inconclusive. It's amazing what can magically happen to DNA when you're a billionaire. In her soul, she believes Joe to be a good man and gives him a proposition. We keep each other good. She will say yes to everything he wants if he's there to help her from losing herself. If you do this for me, I will do the same for you. 
This leads him to open up about who he is, and his real name, Joe Goldberg. But what I found interesting is whether or not Kate knows the truth that he killed her father. All she says on the matter was that Tom was murdered for money, implying she believes that Hugo was the murderer. Nadia, however, can't let Joe escape knowing he's this psychopathic killer. With the help of her friend Edward, she breaks into his flat and searches for his trove of souvenirs, something that would pin him as the Eat the Rich killer. But Joe is a step ahead and divides is an ingenious plan to stop Nadia. He kills Edward in broad daylight, gives Nadia the murder weapon so her prince will be on it, and has already stashed the Eat the Rich Killer's souvenirs at Nadia's place to look as though she found out Edward was the killer and killed him for it. Woo, that was a lot to get through. It also works perfectly since Edward used his parents' news company to steal files about the Eat the Rich Killer, which further supports Edward as the Eat the Rich Killer. I wonder if this also means Dawn will be set free from jail as she was previously framed for those murders. Joe narrates that Nadia said nothing in her defense. She knows that if she did, she'd be dead. Joe is now this multi-billionaire, and he could have her off in jail if he wanted to. The ending also gives us some closure on some of the other members of the elite group we've followed throughout the season. Phoebe tied up all her business and moved to Thailand to teach kids. She's finally doing something she loves and something that will make a difference, and she's not being manipulated for her money. Blessing and Sophie bought Sundry House after Adam's death. Rold returned to London after accidentally shooting a personal friend at a farm, and Connie relapsed. But the show fast forwards several months to New York City, where the show began way back in season one. Kate has assumed control of her father's company, and with the help of her vast wealth, a now clean-shaven Joe has had his entire history scrubbed clean, just like how Tom had many of his scandals and bad press scrubbed from the web. In front of them is a journalist doing a puff piece on the two's philanthropic endeavors, and it looks as though Kate's art foundation is a hit with plans to open one up in London. But here are a few important things we can take away from this scene. Joe and Kate are not married, with Joe saying that Kate has simply been too busy for them to elope. I can't help but think that's a bullshit excuse, and there's something deeper there. Joe has also bought a struggling bookshop, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's Mooney's from season one. We also get our first glimpse of Cynthia, Tom's legal counsel and de facto fixer. I'm curious whether they'll make her a bigger player in season four five, considering all the backroom negotiating she was able to do. Nadia Albina, the actress who plays her, advocates for more disabled representation in film, television, and theater. Joe also sees Reese in the window's reflection. Just like Joe survived his date with death, it looks as though Reese has too. But what we don't know is if Joe realizes Reese is there, or if he's embraced Reese as a part of him. I'm inclined to believe he does know Reese is there, since his last line in the season is him talking about how killing has become much easier easier now, and that he's finally honest with himself about it. As of the writing of this video, a season 5 has not been confirmed, but if it's a go, expect Joe's next chapter to take place in New York with a focus on his relationship with Kate and Reese. What new obstacles will force Joe to protect his love, and with all that extra money, how much farther can he go? Now I want to hear what you thought about the latest season in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, my dick's never been softer.